excited to introduce our guest, Larry Abramson, who I'm going to introduce kind of officially before Toby takes us into this conversation. So born in 1954 in South Africa, Larry Abramson went on to live in Israel in 1961. He studied at the Chelsea School of Art in London between 1973 and 74, received the Colonel Award for Young Artists from the Israel Museum in 1979. He is assistant director of the Jerusalem Print Workshop at the Florence Miller Art Center, where much of the most interesting printmaking in Israel today takes place. He also acts as advisor to Mishkenot Shananim Art Center. Although he still sees himself primarily as a painter, the disciplines and opportunities provided by printmaking were significant in the development of his art, allowing him to clarify his use of color and form. His prints tend to follow a strict formal structure with a square format and limited palette. Abramson constructs his screen prints by progressive overprintings of more or less transparent colors, partially covering or exposing the layer underneath. The result of this is that he creates several, several planes within the image and the sensation of an emerging or submerging image, the feeling that you are looking at reflections never quite able to see the actual source of the image. Abramson has held many one-man shows in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and New York, and also participated in numerous group exhibitions. He is a founding member of Artists Without Walls, a dialogue group of Israeli and Palestinian artists, and was chairman of Betzalel Academy's Fine Art Department between 1992 and 1999, and in 1996 became the founding director of the Betzalel Program for Young Artists, the postgraduate program, which became the first master of fine arts course in Israel jointly with the Hebrew University. So, um, I'm very glad, very excited, very honored. I know I say this a lot, but it's true. And passing it over to you, Toby. Wow, I want to meet Larry again after seeing everything he accomplished. <laughs> this is great. So um, as you know, all the people I uh, have introduced you to are people I don't only admire as artists, but as human beings. Um, Larry and I met when we were still in our teens, I think. Um, uh, he was working at the Jerusalem print shop or did we, we met at a frame shop. This is like uh, Leonardo Drew and Meryl Eucalese, both of them, we're, we're trying to figure out the exact time, but I do remember meeting him and blown away by his amazing smile, which you can even see on the screen, and also by his uh, such modesty. Um, his work has always been very thoughtful. Um, I think that has not changed from day one. Uh, and his interest in humanity and um, how we have to make the world a better place. I had talked about in the beginning, um, you know, Leonardo, you know, each artist has things they care about most. And I'm going to, that's the first question I'm going to say to Larry is why make art? And I also want him to answer right after that. He's a breathtakingly talented teacher and printmaker. And I, I want to hear from you, Larry, that I believe you were put on this planet to make art, but also your ability to teach is amazing. He is also married to a, a phenomenal writer. And she's going to, as we did with Jack uh, Eucalys, we're going to have her coming at the very end just to show her face. Um, because I believe an artist is not living in a vacuum. An artist needs a community. Um, and a community sometimes is your partner and your offspring. He also has amazing children. So Lawrence, as I call him Lawrence, he calls me Tobias. So we're Lawrence and Tobias. So now you know how we see each other when we try and see each other at least once or twice a year when I go to Israel or when he comes to New York. Um, and so Larry, why do you make art and talk for a minute? And then we're going to see all his work. Don't worry. Um, why make art why teach art and what was your fascination in, in printmaking? Hello, everyone. Thank you for those uh, introductions. Hi. Um, the introductions were slightly biased towards printmaking, uh, which if, if I were to determine like chapters in my artistic life, that would be chapter number one in which uh, I found really my, my footing in, in the art world via working with real living artists 
in real challenging situations in the print shop. So I didn't really study art despite that one year I did it uh, at the Chelsea School of Art. I, I dropped out of uh, uh, formal learning and I, I became what, you know, what is the term, what everything has a, a name. So this would be an auto didact or what's the word in English? Someone who is self-taught. So uh, self-taught. So my the 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 site in which my more significant learning took place was the print workshop, because there I learned the secret of the integration of the te of technique and ideas, not via theory plus studio work, but via their integration in real life situations, working with artists uh, as a master printer, working with artists who faced you know, real dilemmas in real time. And I learned firsthand you know, what a real uh, creative process looked like. So this to me was very important. And in a way, in later years, uh, what I tried to to replicate in the art schools I directed. I also, uh, the, you didn't mention this, but I also uh, currently in the past, um, uh, say 17 years, I've been involved in a different art school in the Tel Aviv area in Ramat Gan, the Shankar College, where we established a, a school of uh, fine art of multi, disciplinary art and I headed that department also in a few years ago. So in all the places what I tried to apply was my experience as a, a young person working with experienced artists and learning directly from them and from their experience. So the question, the first question you asked me Toby, why make art? I really cannot answer. I don't have any options. There's no alternative. This is like, why breathe? You know. I want you to know, Lawrence, all of us said the same thing. So you're now, you're keeping it straight on target. Perfect, that's A plus. Yeah. I mean, we can theorize about it and think what is the function of art, but on the personal level, this is like an axiom. It's not uh, something that I ever deliberated, perhaps very early on in my teens, I wondered whether that was the, the uh, I knew my body wanted to paint. Uh, I knew my mind was involved and, and uh, challenged. I wasn't sure whether socially that was a viable choice, but uh, the, I really had no alternative. It was much stronger than me. Uh, it's interesting that despite my, despite my, let's say my unsuccessful attempt to be an art student. Uh, I first went to the Hebrew University. I didn't really want to go to art school uh, because I had the kind of romantic notion that art wasn't something you can actually learn and that you had to experience it. So I thought I could learn the, uh, the history of art and I went to the uh, Department of Art History at the Hebrew University and I took a, the, the one year, turned out to be one year of the BA program, but I couldn't stand the attitude of the, the professors, the historians to art as a kind of historical object that needed to be defined in terms of iconography and composition and so on. So after one year I left that and then, then I went to talk to the only person I knew in the art world who was my art instructor at uh, high school. And he said, don't go to art school in Israel, they'll spoil you, you must go overseas. And I said, overseas, where overseas? And he said, either New York or London. So London seemed closer and somehow more familiar, coming from an English speaking South African Jewish family with parents who like read Shakespeare to each other uh, in the evenings. 
So I went to London and it, well, it was accepted to the Chelsea School of Art, but I couldn't stand that either because I felt there was a lot of waste of time there. There was no, not enough uh, hands-on uh, uh, experience there. There's too much talking about art. So I left and went back to Jerusalem and then I had the good fortune of stumbling upon the, the print workshop in Jerusalem. It had just been founded and I became part of that. I, I was there for like 10 years and then I was invited to teach painting at uh, Bezalel Academy. So that was about in 1984 when I started teaching and eventually they, uh, they asked me to stay on and they asked me to become a professor and then they asked me to become head of the department. And so in all those years, I was really trying to like uh, help young people go through a better learning experience than I had. And I can talk about that if you like or anything. No, else no, no, that was perfect. That's what I wanted. I wanted everyone to hear that if you, if it doesn't work, you can change it and make it work. And now I know many of Larry's students that come to SVA for a semester abroad and they all talk about the fact that he gives them roots and wings. He really pushes everyone to find their own voice. Um, and I think the reason you're such an amazing um, educator is because you also worked with artists at the print shop and got into their heads and helped them find their voices. So I don't think it matters if the artist is more well-known than you or less well-known than you or where they are in their journey. If you're opening if you're open to listening, which I think you do well, and as somebody who's a master printer has to do with the artist um, that they're working with, you can take that into being an educator. And um, I know many of you have enjoyed the classes. I give Larry and I teach in a very similar manner where it's a lot of looking at the work, hearing what everyone wants to do. So let's start with looking at Larry's work and we're gonna go through um, his whole career. I mean, this is only halfway through his career because I believe in I may have an S room until 120. So he's got a long way to go. Um, he's been in the Venice Biennale. I just wanted you to see this. You all can see these, uh, the whole history of Larry after the class is over. It goes online. So if you liked it, please tell your friends and they can share it on YouTube. Um, but he's shown all over the place. He's had solo shows at the Israel Museum, at the Tel Aviv Museum, at the Haifa Museum. Um, and one of the things that I want to talk about later is over the past 30 years, he's been very committed um, to equal coexistence between Israelis and Palestinians. And I, I think that is something I would like to dwell on towards the end of the day. But to be chairperson, at both B'Tselel and Shankar, which are very different schools, I think is a real tribute to him as an artist and as an educator. Um, so let's go to the first piece. And I remember that piece. Toby? Yes? Allow me to add that uh, in three weeks time, I'll be um, leaving Shankar and going, ending my academic career. So that's a good reason to celebrate. There'll be more time for the studio. I, I was gonna say that at the end, but thank okay. you for saying it now. <laughs> Larry had told me a while ago that he was leaving, but I'm happy you said it. And, but I think it's very important. There's, there's a time and a place for everything. Um, if he were still alive, Jack Witten, who's one of my closest friends, uh, unfortunately he's not alive anymore. Otherwise he would have been the first of the group. Uh, and he left when he turned he was a little older than you, Larry, but when he hit 70, he said, I've done enough teaching at Cooper Union and SVA, and now I'm just going to work on my work. And I think there's always a time and a place for everything. So I want to start with this piece, Larry. Uh, it's called the, um, the Yellow Square or Canopy, and that was done in, 1990, uh, in 1979. And then I would like you to spend a minute about Bertha Erdang, who Bertha Erdang was one of the most well-known um, 
uh, 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 um, gallery owners who moved to New York and she showed the most important Israeli artists and Larry was in the last group of the artists that she showed. But you have to think about when this was done. If you remember the gallery tours that I show you, it's always important when a work is done. We have to think about color theory. We have to think about a canopy. What does that all mean? And it's always great to see scale. So why don't you talk about this first work and, and tell a little about who influenced you and why that's how your work started. Well, my, my early work in the 70s was a lot to do with uh, uh, the dead end of, of painting under the modernist uh, regime or the modernist ideology. So, and this now we can, when I talk about it, it all sounds very theoretical, but in fact, it was a really an, uh, kind of existential dilemma. Uh, you know, I knew I wanted to paint. My body wanted to paint. I had this desire to paint. Uh, and on the other hand, if you looked at the history of painting, the recent history of painting, uh, the painting in the 20th century, uh, you, you were led to believe that painting had played its course, that it had completed its mission. It was no longer needed and no longer relevant. This is in the 1970s. You know, other attitudes replaced painting, more conceptual attitudes, more textual attitudes, idea art, conceptual art. So uh, this was a real impasse. And the way I worked with the problem was to actually incorporate the dead end, the, the reflexive cycle of abstract painting into my work and to find, to try to find a way out of the dead end. So first I worked with uh, black squares and you'll see maybe in the next uh, slides, you'll see some echoes of uh, Malevich's black square from 1915. The, what to him was like the, 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 pig, the, the image of the new, of the new era of, of the modern, of the future but was also for the generations after him and perhaps even for himself was also the end of painting and the beginning of something else. So to work, so I tried to work with this end of painting and I worked with the black square. And then uh, quite soon after that, I created a kind of black square of my own based on the complementary colors of violet and yellow. So I took a black, I took a square uh, and I painted it violet. And then with a very small brush and very painstakingly and uh, specifically, I covered this, the violet square with yellow brush strokes. So, and then layer upon layer upon layer until the, the violet was pushed back and the yellow came forward. And this was my kind of new black square again, a kind of dead end, but a dead end that involved work, involved time and work and a kind of real experience. And then I, in the works at that time, and this work I showed at Bertha Erdang's gallery in, I think, 19, yeah, 1979 uh, in, in, uh, in Manhattan. And um, this was one of the works in which the yellow square is on the wall. And then I took a, I took a square the same size of, uh, of purple violet uh, satin. And I affixed two lines, two uh, wooden lines to the edges of the square and two lines or what would you call them, Toby? Poles, 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 poles. Exactly, two poles. In, in the space. And so I got this kind of uh, canopy that's, uh, you know, like a Jewish marriage Chupa. canopy. Chupa. And this to me was quite moving because in a way I was committing to painting. So I was under the chupa with painting. So this, this is like a significant moment in not being not only being uh, an observer from outside, um, 
um, analyzing the predicament of painting in the 20th century, not only taking a theoretical stance or a critical stance, but also saying, you know, uh, here I am and I'm committing under the chupa to painting. I, I love that. Let's go to the next image because then you'll see. So I wanted you to see, and I, I have to say right now in America and where everyone is talking about Philip Gustin and, um, you know, because he has the big show up here. I love that this was the second piece that we're showing because you can see the violet and the yellow, but here it becomes um, much more cartoony and not nearly as, um, as formal. And I, I think it's important that your ideas are always a part of your work, but you move back and forth very fluidly. So tell a little about this piece. So first of all, you mentioned Gaston, that's nice. It's a nice connection because when I showed, I showed at Bertha Erdang's in 1978 and then in 1979, or 1980 most probably. So it was like, um, uh, on one of those visits to New York, I don't remember which, I went on a gallery uh, crawl and I chanced upon a gallery, I think the McGee Gallery. David McKee, David McKee. McKee, McKee Gallery. And there was a show of small figurative paintings by Philip Guston. Now I knew Philip Guston as an abstract painter. I knew him from all the books about the New York school. And I, I, you know, I respected him. He wasn't one of my heroes, but when these small paintings took my breath away, they opened up a kind of post conceptual language of uh, let's say of drawing and imagery uh, that uh, was fresh and relevant. In his case, it was paintings of books and shoes and skyscrapers and paintings on easels. But that to me was a formative experience. And I took it with me. And when I needed a figurative language, and I think to this day, that's quite true. When I need to resort to a figurative language, uh, the influence of Gustin is very much there to this day. This right. in, terms of the, in terms of the theme was connected to uh, the, the story of Moses on Mount Nebo, Mount Nebo, uh, in in the in the Tanakh, in the Bible, the story goes that God took the aging Moses up to Mount Nebo, which is in the in Transjordan, and showed him the promised land, and said to him, "You can see the land. This is where I'm leading the people." But because you lapsed, your, your faith in God lapsed for a moment on the long road, on the long uh, trip to, to, uh, to the land of Israel, you will be, I will punish you and you will die here. You will not be able to enter the promised land with your body. And to me, that was a, a connection as a painter with the basic predicament of painting by which you can see, but you cannot touch the images painted. You can see whatever, you can see a landscape, you can see an illusionistic image of fruit on a table, whatever it is. But if you want to reach out and touch the, the world uh, represented, you are frustrated by the surface of the painting. You want to go into the image, and your nose uh, hits the surface of the painting. So that basic predicament was very much to me, the issue of seeing, but not entering. And so I, that's, that started a large series of paintings in which in a, in, a, in a way, the painter was Moses. The space of the painting was the promised land. And, uh, and, by extension, the viewer was also in that same position. They became very large. The, 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 the image of the artist Moses and the viewer was life-size. 
and very schematically deli 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 de de delineated. 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 Right. Thank you, Toby. Any time. Delineated. Yeah. And, uh, and so that was a kind of sharing of the predicament with the viewer. So I want to just say, Larry, since, and, and it's very interesting, um, Shirelle, each artist, Leonardo, Merrill, and, and Larry, all have given you different insights of what it means to be an artist. And to me, what you're saying now about the Moses and about the flat plane of a surface, to me, that is fascinating that you might, I've always admired your work, Larry, but when I hear you speak, I understand it on a totally different level, which is great. Let's go to the next one. I don't want to miss um, any images, and we have um, so many images. So um, I'm also thrilled that you're seeing pieces that when you go to Israel, you can see at the Israel Museum or the Tel Aviv Museum. When it says it's in the collection of a museum, it doesn't mean it's up all the time, but it's in their collection. So this is a, a very powerful piece and talk a little about this, but I'm going to keep you moving because I want to make sure that we get to see all the work. You know what? Wait a second. Um, you know what we're going to do, Cheryl? We're going to go through everything in a minute, and then we're going to go back. I just want people to see how much your work changes over 40 years. So let's go through it very, very quickly so you get an inkling. I mean, I, I, these are all beautiful paintings. I mean, look at this. You see how different his work goes and what happens. And these are installations at the Tel Aviv Museum. And then keep going. We're going to go back. I, I love this project, Felix Nussbaum and, and London. You'll see how much his work constantly changes. And I stayed with him in New York when he had a show at, wasn't it at Fre Freeze? No, no, uh, no the, other, the other fair. Um, I forgot. A great art fair in New York. Uh, he was there. So, and I sat Volta. there at his, Volta, at Volta. So let's go back. And now you'll see. I'm excited that I just did that. You get to in his brain and understand how we go. Now let's go back to this. Okay, so now at some point I was dealing with this distance and inaccessibility and it, I got a little fed up with it. I felt it was a little too narcissistic and melancholic to spend your life fretting over the inability to touch reality. So I thought, you know, maybe you cannot, you cannot touch the, the reality, the promised land in its entirety. But you can grasp bits and pieces. So I started reversing the process, more becoming more like a spy, a biblical spy going into the promised land and coming back with some findings to try and represent the totality of, of a land through met metonymy, through you know, details, like the biblical spies brought with them a, a bunch of grapes to represent the land. So I started working with bits and pieces, bits and pieces also from nature and bits and pieces from art and from culture and, and bringing them and assembling them in the studio. And this work was like, it, it came from a kind of pile I had in the studio of things I had brought, like a big rock and some uh, some weeds. And at some point I picked up a piece of cardboard. I don't know, Toby, if you do this in the studio, but sometimes when I want to examine if a color is right for a painting, rather than mess up the painting, you know, I like take a piece of paper or cardboard and I put the paint on and I look at the bit of paint next to the painting to feel if it fits in or not. So I found, I picked up a kind of square of cardboard that I'd smeared some yellow paint on. And I put that on top of the pile of objects in my studio. And suddenly it seemed to me like the yellow square that was by then was like 10 years old in my imagination or in my work that the, the yellow square that had gone out of the wall, gone off the wall, became a canopy, became a flag, became all kinds of uh, contexts that were outside of art. And in a way, I felt I had sent the, this image out into the world like a, like a, a prodigal son 
and it had returned to my studio. So I like this idea of the return of the yellow square. And now the yellow square wasn't the full total format. It was an object among other objects. It was a bit, a piece among other pieces. And that's, that's how this work developed. Fantastic. And if you move, yeah, if go you ahead. move on, uh, yeah, Shirel, we're doing it right move, now. Sure. Yeah. You know, so these are all paintings from that moment where I was assembling like these kind of, I would call it, I, in retrospect, they seem to me like totems, like kind right. of columns of meaning, this and that and this. And so here, this painting was a completely like Roscoe-esque uh, space. It's very large, it's three meters high. What's three meters in, in feet? Large, like nine, very large. Ten, nine, 10 feet. Nine, 10 feet. It, it looks like Rothko meets, um, I don't know if you know him, Shirelle, write it down so they can all see it, Robert Moskowitz. Um, yeah, and, yeah. And Robert, it, it feels like Rothko, um, <laughs> um, um, what's his name? Um, Ed Ruscha and, and, and Moskowitz have a baby and Larry, you are that <laughs> child. Um, because what you do is you're playing with that whole idea of deep space and a totem, as you said, and then this beautiful moon that sits on top that feels like you're beckoning. You know, I love what you said about the yellow square. You're, you're asking the viewer to enter the painting. And I, I love how you brought in Moshe in the beginning that Moshe's on top of the mountain, but he's looking out. And now you're inviting the viewer, come in. join me in my experience, which I think is yes. quite beautiful. Right. Later in... A few years ago, I published a book of my of writings, uh, and I called it "The Painter Is a Spy." The painter is a spy. So that's very much how I uh, how I feel today, uh, ever since about the painter. The painter is like a kind of outsider coming from the edge of civilization, moving in in a way camouflaged. You, you, the, the artist, the painter, looks like a regular person, moves around among regular people, but at the same time, the painter is observing, is uh, uh, looking, is learning, is picking up findings, and then taking them back to the edge, back to the uh, brink, the brink of, the, of society, uh, to look at them, to, to, to scrutinize them. So what, what you're doing also is very much like, I don't know if um, we're going to write this down too, Sherelle, Jasper Johns um, invents this whole vocabulary for himself, as does Rauschenberg, which I took you to the show, whoever was in the galleries um, with me on Thursday, they mine their own works. And Larry does that too. So once you understand his work and you go to a museum show or a gallery show, you're understanding his vocabulary for 20, 30, and sometimes 40 years where he's giving you clues of what the work is, and then you join him in that journey. Go to the next one, because that's, I, I love this one too, Larry. Um, yeah, this one's in America, actually. It's in San Francisco in the Swig collection. And uh, I, I A really... wonderful collection. Larry, mm -hmm. you and I are in that collection together, and they just donated mine to the Yale University. So the Swigs were fantastic collectors. And they bought really important works, and then they eventually give it to museums. So this one, this one is a, is a good a good piece to to demonstrate what I was trying to say before about the spy bringing back findings and the findings, you know. So this, if you look at the background here, it's like a kind of Guston brushstroke, right? It's a kind of Gustonesque depiction of a, an abstract brushstroke, and then. And then in that space, there's the black square, which we mentioned before. And here it's, a, it's, it's not a total image. It's a fragment taken from modernist culture. Then that kind of uh, uh, um, amorphic shape in the middle, that dark shadow, shadow was something I did with a, the, the kind of, what's the word, the, the stalk of a banana bunch, not a bunch, a whole cluster of bananas that I found in, in, a, in a garbage bin 
on the way to my studio and I took it to the studio and I put it on the painting. I hung this, uh, this uh, uh, kind of stalk on the painting. At the time in my studio, I had, uh, there was no natural light in, the, in that studio in Jerusalem. And I had two projectors aimed at the wall I was painting the paintings on. So when I put the stock there, it cast a double shadow. And I captured that shadow and I painted it in. So that was that kind of um, image in the middle. And then one other morning on the way to the studio, I picked up a, a, leaf, a spinach leaf or a mangled leaf from our kitchen and took it to the studio and started painting it in different contexts. It like dried up in the studio. And this is like a, in, into, in the middle of it drying up, it's already not green and, and uh, uh, juicy as it was at the beginning. And later on it crumbled and became like dust. And I kept on painting it in different contexts. But here I painted it into the painting. And then again, also here I like picked the moon out of the heavens and put it into the pile together with the other things. So it's really a kind of mishmash it's a, of images taken from different parts, but all of them with the intention of bringing them close, of touching them. And that I think is the significance of painting here. It's, you know, painting as opposed to like digital uh, uh, technology, it's really, a, really tactile. It's really about the, the senses and about being there and touching. All right, let, let's go to the next one. Cause I, now we're gonna go, this to me, I, I remember how you shift. And this to me is a very, very important piece in your career. Um, not that I like it more than anything else, but I loved watching when you and I would talk, what was going on in your mind at different periods. And I know both you and I love Mirandi um, and that beautiful sense of low intensity color. And you can see the fact that Larry has very good painting chops. He can do whatever he wants. It's his decision of what he wants to do. So talk a little about this. I'm watching my time. I'm very careful. So give a little information about this and because I wanna go back and forth between the images. So talk a little about this. Well, let me say this. This is, uh, I was political from a young age, okay? I, in, when I was 16, I signed what later became a, uh, a significant moment in Israeli public life called the Ikhtav I don't know what, how to translate that. The, the high school, the letter of the high school students. This was a letter to Prime Minister Golda Meir in 1971, I think, uh, protesting the fact that she had refused uh, Nahum, Nahum Goldman's request to go to Cairo to talk peace with uh, NASA, uh, who had invited him to come. And Golda said, Niet. She refused. And I couldn't understand that. I couldn't understand because I was brought up on the myth, what turned out was a myth that uh, Israel's hand was always stretched out to peace and that the Arabs refused that outstretched hand. And here the Arabs were stretching out for peace and Israel was refusing. So I was very distressed and, and I heard that there was a demonstration opposite the prime minister's office and that was near my high school in Jerusalem and I went there and there was a, a demonstration and lots of young people and there was a table with this letter by high school students and I added my signature to it in a, in a sense that was like the the left-wing Mayflower of Israeli politics so it's it's a great honor for me uh, to be on that list maybe you know, if we go into darker ages, uh, I may be incarcerated for that signature, but hopefully not. Hopefully Israeli democracy will persevere. So, uh, so that I wanted to say that I was political, but in my art, 
I didn't know how this, how politics uh, could be integrated into paint. And this, so this series in 1990, I started in 1993, and these are the years of the Oslo Accords, which to me were a very significant moment, perhaps the highlight of my life, that moment when Israelis and Palestinians recognized each other and started talking directly to each other how to resolve their conflict. Uh, I started working on a series of landscapes of a site outside of Jerusalem where a Palestinian village had been up to 1948-49 and whose inhabitants were no longer there. So this was a kind of ghost village, very beautiful, very picturesque as ghost villages are, as ruins are in the history of painting. Ruins are always part of a kind of classical landscape. So, but for me, this landscape wasn't classical. It was political. It was, a, it was the, the landscape of denial, of blindness. And I started a kind of, I won't go into all of it. I started painting these paintings. Uh, if you can go back uh, one, uh, sure. So I, I painted these canvases and when the paint was still wet, I, I uh, blotted them with sheets of newspaper that I had in the studio. Okay. And then I got, I got these blotted images. So I had a destroyed, a ruin of a landscape painting. And can you switch to the next? And I had these traces of the landscape painting and nowhere was the actual landscape painting because you could not, the surface, the original surface had been torn away from the painting. So I had these ruins of painting in a way relating to the ruins of the village and also relating to, to a process of abstraction that to me at that point, I realized that the popularity of lyrical abstraction in Israeli art was very much due to the fact that it enabled Israelis to be universal progressive uh, supporters of the most, what they saw as the most advanced uh, style of art at the time. And at the same time, because it's abstract, not to see reality. So I was trying to, I was picking a fight with many uh, agents uh, is Zaritsky, the artist, the leader of the New Horizons uh, school, the New Horizons group of lyrical abstraction who were very successful in the 50s in Israeli art. He's, he's considered like the Cezanne of Israeli art. And um, so I had this series of destroyed paintings. I had this series of, of traces on newspaper. I had, did, did, I think, 34 paintings, 34 blottings. And then if you can go on to the next. I want to stop was, you for a minute, Larry. I, yeah, well, I remember when I came and I saw those, I don't know if you remember, but I told you it looked like, I don't know if all of you know this and please Sherelle, write this down. Um, uh, um, um, de Kooning did these very famous blotted pa uh, pieces on newspaper of the figure. And he talked about how the figure in his paintings were very present and in the newspaper blottings, they sort of disappeared. And conceptually, I thought, I, I told you this at the time, Larry, I was blown away by them because what you said about, uh, and somebody just wrote in there that you have so much to say, I wish we had three hours, but we don't. But I'll invite you back again another time. But I wanna talk about the fact that you don't separate anything of who you are as an artist. And Shirelle, remember I told you it'd be amazing? I mean, I'm so excited that you're, you're, you're living up to what I hoped you would do, because as an artist, you're breathtakingly talented. You are. I don't, I'm happy to say it publicly. I'm happy it's being recorded. But your subtlety of imagination is as subtle as your work. In other words, there's a saying, I'm maven yavin, the wise person understands. But as did, um, uh, uh, um, uh, de Kooning with the figure where you saw it, but you didn't know. In fact, my undergraduate thesis was on those figures of de Kooning. And, and very, um, when you look at the bottles 
of Morandi, they're not only about bottles. And what I love is the blotting uh, surface. It's almost like they're monoprints. And I think you get that from your, your printmaking background that sometimes a monoprint, which is a one of a kind print, gives more importance. Not that I don't like the original paintings, but there's something so powerful in their life that they're telling you more and more stories. So now we can go to the next one. I'm sorry to interrupt you. So you, you don't gave, interrupt. Thank you. Thank you for those connections. Very important. Well, you gave me, I own one of these little um, pieces of yours um, on my wall. You're right next to um, two artists who I adore. Um, and it, what's so powerful is it's, it's so simple, but it tells so, so much. So let's talk about that for a minute. So th this is the third, the third part of the Tsuba project. Tsuba is that village uh, uh, I was talking about. And uh, after doing the, pa the, the landscape paintings and destroying them and keeping the, destro the newspapers, sheets and the, the destroyed paintings, I felt that that had more or less, that had more or less uh, expressed the complexity of what I was feeling about abstraction and very much also it connects back to Moses looking at the promised land, only now the promised land was reversed and it was a kind of colonial, uh, a colonialist gaze towards somebody else's land and very complex, but that more or less did it for me. But I felt that I hadn't expressed the experience of actually walking through these ghost homes, these crumbling uh, buildings. Uh, and, and I went back to the site and I came back to the studio with, you know, bits and pieces that I'd collected as, again, as a spy, I'd connected my findings and took them back to the studio. And I ended up making 13 of these temple uh, illusionistic paintings of branches I took to the studio from the site. And here I used that same thing I showed you with the banana uh, stalk that I put the actual branch on a painting. The, I had prepared the, the field, the color field of the painting. I, I painted in uh, the kind of color of the sky over the site as I remembered it. And I placed the, I placed the actual branch and I looked at it under the double uh, beams of the two projectors I had, the two, two lamps. And I painted the, the shadows and I painted the branch in. So, so here, this I complemented the gaze into the landscape that the landscape works had. And this is a kind of, kind of a, an image piercing the eye. It's like bouncing out of the canvas and imp, uh, implicating you. You cannot, you cannot uh, hold a passive kind of aesthetic point of view because here the image is actually coming out and pricking you in the eye. Beautiful, let's go to the next. So this is a show that I remember in 2010 at the Tel Aviv Museum. And I think it's very important to understand um, when you see an individual piece, it has a different uh, power than if you see a whole installation. Um, and, and that is why I wanted this image in the lecture today, both of these, because you understand Larry's mind. I, I think it's great if you want to own one of them, but there's a difference between understanding something in depth and when you actually, yes go ahead actually in this case you cannot you cannot own one of them no so no but it, you did have little ones i have one of the yeah, little yeah. i had i had things uh, works that were closely connected but this right. as i exhibited it in 1995 i i declared the whole exhibition as one work and it cannot be broken up yeah, but without, and that's, and, and what I was trying to say in there is that is why, you know, an installation is different. You remember last week we saw Meryl Eucalyse's piece, and that's what I wanted to talk about. She kept those intact as well, even though they're individual smaller pieces. 
And if you remember, we saw the first week with Leonardo Drew. Do you remember the way Leonardo talked about what he did at the Hammer Museum and at different museums sometimes, <laughs> and like what he did at the Met? And, I, and, and um, there were pieces from that, the, the piece that the Met bought and that the Hammer bought are the whole installation, but you could get one element of it, not from the installation, but from that body of work. And I think that is what's so exciting. When you see it all together, you understand what was going on in Larry's mind. So let's go to the, so this is, I want you to talk, this is a, an amazing piece. And, uh, and tell them about Felix Nussbaum House and anyone knows his work, you should know his work. He's an amazing artist. And if you don't know him, my close friend, Emily Bilski, who's an art historian who's, who did one of the books on my work, was obsessed with Felix Nussbaum, very important artist. Larry, give a one minute. I'm watching my clock here because I don't want to go late. Do a one minute on who Felix Nussbaum was and tell everyone the award you got and what you did there. So Felix Nussbaum was a young artist in Germany uh, in uh, the early 1930s, late 1920s. He was a budding young artist. His career was just taking off. In 1933, he got he, he got a, an award to go to the, the German Academy in Rome. And uh, of course, 1933 is the year the Nazis came to power. And very soon after that, he was expelled from the German Academy in Rome. And he started what you could call a kind of escape route, running from his destiny as a Jew in Europe. Uh, under uh, the Nazi expansion. And he went to uh, North Italy and Belgium and France and Belgium in, uh, in um, hiding in secret apartments uh, uh, with his, uh, with his, uh, um, his girlfriend or wife, uh, who was also an artist. So, the, and eventually he was caught in 1944 and he was sent on the last transport to Auschwitz and uh, and murdered there. So that's that's like a that's like a normal Jewish story. But the outstanding thing about Felix Nussbaum was that he did, he never stopped painting. So he was escaping from death, and he was painting. And his painting evolved in these few years. It evolved from a more like um, light-hearted kind of uh, figurative painting into a very committed understanding of the role of the artist as a witness of history. I'm getting goosebumps as you say, Shirelle, I there's a beautiful book on him. I want to make sure that everyone gets that information. He, brilliant artist. But now Actually, it's funny. Toby, I'll, yeah. in 1990. Mm, 1985, I visited you in New York and I was over there for, for some, you know, to show portfolios here and there. And I remember standing in the subway in one of the stations and on the wall was a big poster with the very famous, today very famous image of Felix, a painting, of a self-portrait. Right. Where he, he's trapped in a corner between two walls and he's got his yellow star and his hat and he's can't escape from his destiny that is hounding him. And it was a show at the Jewish Museum uptown in New York. That's what, and and that's what Emily Bilsky was involved with. It was a brilliant right. show. I'll never forget so, it. Right. But I want to, this is like history, historical decisions, moments. So I'm standing there and I see this and it's, it's very interesting to me, but I was on the way to, at the time it was the East Village to look at the, the new galleries. And so I, have, I had a dilemma for a moment and I chose the East Village. So that's a very important show I didn't see. And I, I carried it with me, that moment of choice and that kind of missing something that, I, that could have been significant. And in 1996, 11 years later, the Israel Museum had a show of Felix Nussbaum and I rushed there and I was blown away. So this was a, a moment and I took my students there and since the, I don't know if you know Michal Helfsman, sure. uh, 
right? So Michal was my student at the time at B'Tzalel, and I took my class there and talked about Felix Nussbaum, and she later on did uh, a very, like, uh, prominent piece, an installation regarding Felix Nussbaum. But for me, Felix Nussbaum came up in, in the early, two th uh, the early, what's the word, the, year, the two, 2002, two two thousand two three four I was, uh, I, I, sh I put away all my paints and I just worked with charcoal on paper for two or three years. And I worked in relation to images that then were very dominant in the public eye, in the press. Uh, they were connected to uh, the surge of terrorist attacks in Israel and Israeli uh, campaigns into the uh, Palestinian territories and the reconquering of uh, the West Bank. And there was a lot of destruction everywhere. So I, and I was very depressed uh, politically and in a way depressed personally. And for me to, to put aside the, the, all the colors and just to work, to go back to basics, to work with charcoal, with burnt wood on paper was a kind of desire perhaps to start afresh. And I, I, I took photographs of demolition sites, like civilian demolition sites, old buildings torn down to build new ones, not, uh, not bombed out buildings, but actually, you know, regular process of contractors and, you know, wanting to make some more money. Uh, so I took these pictures, took them to the studio and started painting piles, piles of debris and not painting, sorry, drawing. And the, the drawings grew and they become, became full body size. And I worked on that for a long time. I worked on uh, destroyed buildings, the, uh, demolished buildings in Rehavia and Jerusalem. Uh, I one day saw on the news that they were doing, they were demolishing the old townhouse of uh, the city hall of Rehovot. So I went there the next day, I took photographs of that and piles of debris that contractors dumped here and there. And this was a series of piles. And it was also connected to my leaving Bezalel at the time and being very disappointed with my colleagues and the behavior of people in general. So I was feeling very uh, demolished and and leaving Bitsalel, I had like some money in a travel fund that if I wasn't to use it, it would just be go back to the general funds of the institution, which I didn't want to do. I didn't <laughs> want that to happen. So I decided to go to see the Felix Nussbaum Museum that had just been built. I read about it. It was designed by Daniel Liebeskind, the architect, very like, groundbreaking architecture, the first museum he actually built. He later built the Jewish Museum in Berlin and the War Museum in, in England. And I, I sent an email to the museum. I just said, this is, my, I, I'm, this is my name. I'm an artist. I'm coming to visit the museum on this and this date. And I immediately got back an email from the director of the museum who said, Let's meet. So this was a very like serendipitous uh, moment. And I met her. She took me through the whole Felix Nussbaum thing. At the end, she said, show me what you are doing these days. And I showed her these drawings of the piles of debris. And she said, when you finish the group, I want you to show it at the museum. And and that was like what, uh, once in a lifetime, that kind of moment happens. You don't have to, you don't even try and the museum invites you to show. And at that, at that, on that day, I said to her, look, the, I, this last painting of Felix Nussbaum, I don't think it's on the, no, it's not on the, uh, on the presentation, but this last painting was a painting of the angels of death 
dancing a macabre dance on top of the, the debris of European high culture, music, architecture, geometry, all the science and arts of Europe under the feet of the angels of death, the skeletons. So Such I said, powerful. yeah, really powerful, worth, worth looking at. So I said to her, I want to, if, I'm, if I succeed, I would like that show to include a work, a tribute to Felix Nussbaum, a dialogue with him, a one-sided dialogue. And that's the work we saw before in which I incorporated, I incorporated, this is a very large piece because each, each of the six panel. segments, each panel is like a large sheet of paper. Uh, so it's very large and for a drawing. And uh, I incorporated, I looked at his painting as his preparatory sketches and at my pile of, uh, piles of debris that I had collected, and I like looked at the piles, and I my eye fell on something, and I drew it into the drawing, and then I went back. So it's like a combined pile of the debris of culture, as seen by Felix Nussbaum and by myself. I, I want to get. I'm watching the time, Larry, and I'm nervous because I want to show the others. But I want to just say I, I didn't think of this until now. But you should also, everyone should think about how William Kentridge uses charcoal and drawing and, and does films based on that. And I, these are such strong pieces, but let's go to the next because I'm watching my time and I, I, I wanna get to everything else. Because we only have 11 minutes left. So I wanna keep on moving. So, so Rose oh. of... Yeah. Rose of Jericho, one day I went to visit my friends at the print workshop in Jerusalem. And I walked into the director's office and I saw a scene there where one man was handing a very peculiar looking uh, plant to my friend, uh, Arik, the director of the workshop. And I said, what's that? And I said, oh, this is the Rose of Jericho. Don't you know it? No, I don't. And then they told me the story. It's a plant that grows in the, in the desert. It blooms once and dies, it's, you know, and it dries up and dries up into a kind of ball. Uh, and only when a flash flood occurs or once in a blue moon, some rain comes down in the desert, does it absorb the, the humidity and opens up. And so this dead plant opens up and drops some of its dry seeds into the moist ground. So this is, I, I love this, uh, this idea of resurrection, this, this potential in a ruin, in, a, in the ruin of a, of a plant, that there's still life in potential and also in practice. So it became a kind of metaphor, I wasn't the first artist to be fascinated by it. Uh, Lillian, the, the early uh, 1904 or something, Lillian, uh, Fai Moshe Lillian, the early Zionist German artist, uh, did a cover of uh, Ostun West, uh, the Zionist journal, where he portrays the daughter of Zion entangled in the thorns of the diaspora and holding a rose of Jericho as a symbol of like national uh, revival. There's a whole history to this plant, I won't go into it, but I started painting them. Uh, I, 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 I tried to create a painting that was like a desert, a very dry surface, and to work with paint that was very wet and fluid that would soak up into the surface. And uh, so this is one of the paintings from that period. All right, let's go to the etching. next. Yeah. We, yeah. We, we're going to go through these quickly because there's one at the end that I don't want to miss and I'm watching let's, my clock. We can not talk about it. We can just see no, it. Oh, no, I love this piece. Yeah. It's back to the yellow square. But do like yeah. a sentence on each one now because these are so important. Yeah. So this is like uh, in the 
like after those black and white drawings, the charcoal, the end, like that kind of devastating destruction, uh, also of painting, I came back to life like the Rose of Jericho. <laughs> and I started painting with a new kind of, uh, uh, a new kind of freshness and an openness. And I started working not only with kind of poles or columns of collected bits and pieces, but also building a space, a space of fragments. So in the, so 2006, the, red, the yellow square returned the game. So this is back to the yellow square. And this is here, uh, uh, the black square that we talked about. And then one of the abstract images becomes a, uh, a kind of house with windows, so you get a kind of model of uh, of what in Hebrew I would call makom, of a place. You know what constitutes a meaningful place. You need ground. You need some kind of horizon line. You need uh, to place a home there. You need some kind of uh, vegetation. In this case, it's the shadow of that palm leaf, palm fund. And you also, sadly, you also, uh, every white has a black and uh, there's also usually, at least in my experience, a separation barrier stuck in between. In Arcadia, death always dwells. And I, I think it's in Arcadia Ego. You go back for a minute. I love the way you painted the trompe wood. And I think what you started to do in the later years is your sense of space keeps changing. And that's what's so exciting for me is to look at your work, look at the first work, and you're giving more and more information about what is there and what is not there. So if you have the privilege of knowing an artist for so many years, the work keeps building on itself and the narratives keep growing. So as in, I, again, I'm going to bring in Jasper Johns. Jasper Johns brings back his images in there, as do you. Let's go to the next. I love this next one. And think of that in relationship to the first image we saw. And this makes me think of a sukkah, you know, like. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. It is a sukkah. It's like a sukkah kfanim, a vine sukkah, a vine, what would you call it in English? You know. I don't know. You have a vine growing on, on some uh, poles and- it Oh, right. A, it's like in, an, like in a, um, not an orchard, like in a, um, a, a vineyard, in a vineyard. Yeah, but a vineyard, but intended, intended to be a place, again, a right. place where you can sit and take the air and relax and rest. So at, at this, in here, in, in these paintings, I was thinking a lot in terms of, uh, uh, utopias and their and their destruction, like the, the way a utopia always uh, a gazebo. Always, Thank you, whoever said that. Yeah, a gazebo. Right. So a utopia always entails its own uh, impossibility. It's Michel Foucault said that when you when you realize a utopia in reality, it becomes oppressive. So here I was thinking in terms on the one hand of the tranquility of sitting and resting under your vine. And at the same time, the vine is, the, the grapes are black and perhaps whoever planted them is not there to enjoy them anymore. All right, let's go to the next. I, again, this one is such a beautiful one, Larry. I love this. Yeah. So here I was working, at, uh, I started working with botanical, illustrations that were significant for me in those early years when my parents uh, emigrated to Israel and I was a young seven, eight, nine-year-old child uh, wanting to, to develop a new identity to become an Israeli. And one of, the, one of the mechanisms that was very central in those years was the love of nature the uh, and the knowledge of nature, the knowledge of the wild flowers. At first, we used to pick them. Then we started to protect them, and it was very much the same thing that the that the the wild flowers 
were a kind of symbol of belonging. And for me, that was significant. And in later years, when I became more critical of that mythology, I started to use these images from a book that I remember from my childhood with illustrations by, um, I forget her name right now, but by a botanical illustrator, Koppel, Ruth right. Koppel. Right. And I started to put the, the images into the paintings, but as you can see here, the, the, um, the size of the image, the black shadow of the image and the, and the, the unrootedness of, of the plant are very much working as a critique of the idea that if you, if you make, if you are intimate with nature, you also, the land belongs to you. So to me, the land doesn't belong to anyone. Right. This piece is so powerful too. It's like unbelievable. I mean, Larry, what you have done with your vocabulary and trying to get so much information and narrative across to me is very strong because you're saying something very important, but you're, you're not yelling it, you're stating it very clearly. And I think what makes great art is if the person seeing it can learn from what you're doing without being scolded in a way that you just can't listen. Yeah, I don't think my role as an artist, I don't see it as, uh, as preaching. Right. A kind of moralistic point of view. It's more like, as I said, a spy. Right. Uh, I've been around, I've looked at the, the culture, I've looked at the reality. These are my findings. I've arranged them for you to see and you make of them what you want. I'm not going to dictate your conclusion. I just put together a few things and the things in, in the, the, this series, I called it suprematism because I took the composition and the basic, uh, the basic space from I took Malevich. from uh, Malevich's Malevich. Right, yeah. exactly. I mean, I, I'm so, I, there's one more image, right? There's one more image. That one, I remember seeing this in New York. And right. talk a little about that. And then I want to leave a, a minute or two for people to ask questions. I'm nervous about, because we're technically, we're, we're finished. All but I time. want you to just do this one. Yeah. Yeah, so this is from the same... Uh, the same period. Um, yeah, I didn't talk much about, I, I said, maybe I showed you the shadow of the, of the stalk and I talked about the ghost image of the village. Over the years, I've become very interested in, in uh, the trace things leave. Not so much the thing itself, but the, the trace it leaves. So, you know, like the imprint something leaves or the shadow of the object, less the object itself and more the shadow. In a, in a way, I think the shadow is, is the essence of, the, of images. In Hebrew, it's also linguistically very interesting because tzel is shadow and tzelem is image. So the, the shadow is right there uh, ling, in terms of language it's right there in the concept of the image that's also connected to the image of God, of course, in Hebrew. So everything connects. So in, in this work, which I called Index, uh, it wasn't a rational piece. It wasn't something I planned. I, I prepared that surface, the ochre surface over violet. Over the years, violet has become my first paint, the first layer is always violet over that ochre. So in a way it's, a, it's an echo now that I think of it, of the yellow square. That of course, saw. of course. Yeah, and then those, those gestures, those scrapings of the lighter ochre paint. And then I had a kind of wall. So I had a very dry kind of surface, a wall. And I started putting shadows or images or indexes on that wall. So things came in, you know, so yeah, some of them I've talked about. We talked about the moon. We talked about the black square. We talked about the botanical images. The gun we don't have to talk about because it's so pro predominant. And the prosthesis, the artificial limb comes from my personal biography because a few months after my parents emigrated to Israel, I was 
I was hit by a bus and I lost my leg. So this is a very like uh, confessional painting. Uh, and uh, there it is, it's in New York. It was purchased for a collection in New York. That's strange. Who would believe someone would want this in their home? <laughs> well, I want to, I want to, before can we stop sharing for a minute because I just want to say I'm so thrilled that uh, you had the uh, chance to hear Larry I, he's uh, somebody I admire so deeply I, I think you have a beautiful neshama a beautiful soul um, I've learned so much from you as an artist and as a human being he's also now a grandfather and I think that's made him my, you know, very, uh, it's a whole new life. He's married to a fantastic writer. And last week you met Jack Eucles. So if your amazing wife is there for a minute, I'd love her to come in, Shlomit, for a second if she, oh, she's not there. But no. um, she's a wonderful writer. And um, I just want to say, Larry, uh, thank you from all of us. This was remarkable. And you give so much of yourself and I see people shaking their heads. Um, really, it's it's an honor to have had this opportunity of time. Do we have one question, Shirelle, to, or, or not? I don't want to, you have, you have hearts, yeah. We don't have time for questions, but I oh. think you left us, uh, Larry, with so much to think of. And I'm still with the image of the artist kind of collecting for us and bringing this index for us to decipher and read into. Uh, which is a beautiful way, I think, to give responsibility also to the viewers. Uh, and Toby, again, thank you. I think as we meet each artist, it becomes so apparent that the more we know of the work, the more we're able to dive into it. I see here people clapping. Um, I hope you're seeing that, Larry. You got a lot of clapping. I'm seeing. Thank, like thank you very much. I would like more people to show their faces so he sees there are a lot of double families here. Yes. Um, that are very nice. So um, I, I like it when you make it a a communal uh, thing. And Larry, I don't know if you know, that is my Rabbi Saul and Shelley Berman, um, who his values are totally where you are. Um, and I, I just want to say that it's so nice to see many uh, people that uh, Susan and Sheldon and so many people are watching this together. And I thank you from the bottom of our heart. Continue Toby, making Toby. it brilliant art. Yes. Toby, let me yeah. thank you. You're such a mensch. It's a pleasure to talk to you always and also online. It's, it felt very intimate, even though there were other people watching. And, you know, in, in, over a lifetime, you don't make many friends. And it's always, for me, it's like a, a very valuable thing to be able to make a friend and to maintain a friendship. So I want to thank you for that. Amen, as we say in English. <laughs> Amen. So and Nessa was on there too. I don't know if you saw her, Lauren. She's on there. So there um, she is. Hi, Nessa. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Larry. Thank you, Toby. Looking forward to seeing you in our future programs. Have a good day, a good afternoon, or a good night, wherever you are. Thank you. Bye.